So this would mean that uh, the Ark would have the equivalent capacity of roughly 569 modern railroad stock cars, which today, a double-decker stock car holds about 240 sheep. That is still 28,450 animals that we can fit on the Ark with enough food and water for a year. Now, some evolutionists and even a couple of creationists have tried to poo-poo the idea that Noah's Ark is on Mount Ararat. This is sort of a side issue, but I'll, I'll deal with it very briefly. They claim that Ararat is a stratovolcano, therefore Noah's Ark can't be on there. Uh, no. First of all, please check out this picture. This was taken by Don Patton this year, Dr. Patton took these photos. It is pillow basalts. These are textbook examples of pillow basalts. They're found right from ground zero right up to 11,500 feet at least. Now, pillow basalts, while it has been acknowledged that some pillow basalts can form under ice and snow, this, these pillow basalts are radically different than these textbook examples. So no, they weren't made under the snow and ice cap. That's just an ad hoc argument. Furthermore, salt crystals are present on the mountaintop. The ice and snow cap is freshwater. Where the salt crystals come from? It's evidence that the no, that Mount Ararat was formed under salt water as a volcanic eruption. Lastly, take a look at this picture. These are fossils taken from 13,600 feet collected by Dr. Ron Charles off of Mount Ararat right at the snow and ice line. I personally talked to Dr. Charles about these fossils. Now, some would claim that the shells are land shells, land snails. All right, I'm not an expert when it comes to shells, so hey, maybe let, let's assume that they are land shells, or land snails. What are land snails doing crawling up to 13,600 feet, dying under the ice sheet, and becoming fossils? And secondly, the fossil in the bottom left-hand corner is a fossil coral. Corals aren't very good mountain climbers, so I find it highly improbable that either of these creatures were either crawled up the mountain and even less probable that they were somehow spewed up there by volcanic eruptions, etc. Come on, Ian! Multiple types of dating methods give the same ages on the same rock. This proves that radiometric dating methods work. Really? Well, for what we're going to discuss today, for the first part, I'd like to recommend a book. Marvin Lubinow, Bones of Contention. Now, you may not understand the catch at the moment, but uh, if you can, do get a copy of this book. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you his appendix in his book. Uh, all that's all I'm going to discuss, just the appendix, because Skull 1470, which was found by Richard Leakey, Skull 1470 uh, made to be a very excellent case study on the effectiveness of radiometric dating methods and the reliability of these scientific absolute dating methods. Boy, those are big words. Now, brace yourself because you are about to get put on a merry-go-round powered by a really big electric motor. The circular reasoning that is, you are about to be exposed to is enough to make you dizzy and nauseous and I will not be held accountable for it, all right? Okay, so let's take a look at what went on. Now, Skull 1470, this is a picture of it, was found in 1972 by Richard Leakey's team and it was originally believed and claimed by Leakey to be 2.9 million years old. Now, it was found underneath a layer, a volcanic tuff, and it was called the KBS Tuff, named after its discoverer. Now, there were tools, supposedly uh, human tools, found in close association with it. Now, in this case, when they're talking tools, they're talking, you know, stone instruments, that, that kind of tool, or what is believed to have been stone instruments. Now, sedimentary layers cannot be dated by radiometric dating methods because sedimentary layers are made up of, basically, broken up, previous rock, older rock, and it's a mishmash of other rock, so it can't be radiometrically dated. However, volcanic tuff can be radiometrically dated, at least in theory. Let's examine how well the theory stacks up. Now, bear this in mind, many mammals, Australopithecine fossils, I'm going to get to those later on, and human artifacts, or what is believed to be human artifacts, 
were found below the KBS tough. Now, Fitch and Miller were uh, two scientists who first dated the KBS tough. They did a feasi feasibility study in 1969. Uh, now, this was long before the discovery of, of 1470, Skull 1470. In their original study, they came up with ages of 212 to 230 million years old. Oops. This is a problem, because if you recall, I said they found mammal fossils underneath the KBS tuff. So, according to evolution, the, the age of that KBS tuff should be much younger. We got a problem here. So, Fitch and Miller, do they go with their original dates? After all, they are absolute radiometric dates. No. Instead, they wind up bowing to the evolutionary assumptions, and they conclude, oh, our ages must be wrong because of contamination. And so, question number one, how did they know their ages were too old? Hmm? Simple, because of the fossils they found below them. It's that simple. This is based on evolutionary assumptions. Radiometric dating has nothing to do with science. It has to fall in line with evolutionary assumptions or the radiometric ages, which are supposed to be absolute, are found out to be not so absolute and are thrown out the window. But get ready for it. Now the ride gets rough. Now, the rock layer, because of the mammals beneath it, or the, the fossils found beneath it, according to evolution, must be somewhere around 2 to 5 million years old. Bear that in mind. In fact, what Fitch and Miller said in their article was, <laughs> I like this, and I quote, it would only be possible to date this tuff by careful extraction of undoubtedly juvenile components for analysis. Question. Um, how would you know the component you are testing is juvenile? Hmm? Answer? It's very simple. If it, agree, if it gives an age in accord with the evolutionary theory, then it is assumed to be the correct age. Don't believe me? Wait for it. Now, Fitch and Miller conclude that, okay, these, these numbers are way out of whack. We've made a mistake. We've got contamination. So they go and get some new samples. Not only do they test it, they test it with three different types of dating methods. They used potassium argon aid spectrum, argon argon totally de total degassing, and argon argon spectrum. For those of you not technically minded or not familiar with the terms, don't worry about it. I'm giving that for those who are familiar with the terms. They conclude as a consequence of their study that the KBS tuff is very close to 2.16 or 2.61 million years old. In fact, uh, they gave a plus or minus of 0.26 million years. Now, 2.61 million years old was then the accepted date for the KBS tough. Watch what happens. Now, before 1470 was discovered, Vincent Maglio of Princeton, I, I hope I said his name right, Vincent Maglio of Princeton published again in Nature, uh, published his study, which was based on the stratigraphic sequence of the elephant and pig fossils, which were found beneath the KBS tuff, and uh, agreed, his ages seem to agree with Fitch and Miller's date. Now, if you recall, Fitch and Miller originally rejected their original dates of 200 plus million years because of the fossils underneath it. So they rerun the study to agree with the evolutionary assumptions of the fossils found underneath it. Lo and behold, another study confirms that, hey, their ages must be right then because it lines up with the fossils. Starting to see the circularity here? <laughs> it gets worse. In 1974, Brock and Isaac, again in Nature magazine, did paleomagnetism studies. So this is now a third dating type of dating method. Uh, they used paleomagnetism studies on the deposits below the KBS tuff. They took 247 samples. Sounds very impressive, doesn't it? They concluded that the fossils, again, including the 1470 skull, under the tuff were 2.7 to 3 million years old. All right. They said because the paleomagnetic and isotopic dates were close, this, okay, and I quote, this independent evidence greatly strengthens our proposed chronology. However, if you keep reading in the article, you'll also notice they said this independent evidence was actually based partly upon the fossils and, get this, Fitch and Miller's dates. So 
the circle just goes round and round. Oh, the wheels of the mind go round and round. Anyway, okay. 1974, Herford used fission track dating. That's fourth, fourth method. So four different methods used to date these rock layers. Herford used fission track dating on the East Rudolf sediments below the KBS Tuff. They concluded that E or A, either there was no thermal annealing, or B, it was totally annealed at 1.8 million years old. Okay, and here's what they said, what he said in the article. As this tuff is within the Kubai algae formation and is stratigraphically below the 2.6 million year old KBS tuff, the second alternative is accepted as the correct interpretation. Okay, I don't know if you followed that or not. Pay close attention. They had two possible options. Either there was never a thermal encounter with the rock layer they were uh, dating, or it was annealed at 1.8 million years. They rejected the first one and accepted the second one based on the age provided by Fitch and Miller. Now, one must ask, first of all, question. <laughs> if he concluded the sediments below the KBS tuff had been altered by heat, why did they not also question the 2.61 million year old date provided by Fitch and Miller? After all, it's on top which means it should, technically the lower layer should be older than it. So it too should have been affected by the heat. So the second question, why did they ignore the possibility that the sediments had not been affected by the heat? Well, we're going to come back to that. Okay, 1974. Fitch and Miller then publish a revised study on the KBS tuff, on their original KBS dating. They confirmed the 2.61 million year old age they gave it, but they also reported a broad scatter, that's their word, of ages. Now they had 10 different samples. They came back with ages from 520,000 years old to 2.64 million years old. Okay, no problem, because, and I quote, the compatibility of independent evidence is a very strong argument for accepting the chronology now proposed for East Rudolph. Note, the other independent dating methods were based on Fitch and Miller's original 2.61 million year old date. So in other words, they had all these samples that gave ages of 520,000 years old to 2.64 million years old. But they stuck with 2.61 million years because all these other dating methods, which were based on their dating methods, confirmed their dating methods. Are you dizzy yet? Okay. Maybe you want to take some gravel or something to keep the nausea down. Okay, it's going to get dizzier still. Okay, 1974. Okay, this is two years after the discovery of Skull 1470. The KBS tuff had been dated by four different dating methods five different times. Multiple dating methods all confirmed the same age. Oh, what are the odds? What are the odds? I mean, think, look at this. This is, this is a geologist's dream. All these multiple dating methods confirming one another, all coming up with the exact same age of 2.61 million years old. Great. Except now we got a problem. Now, Houston, oh, we got a problem. Skull 1470 gets excavated. Now, here's the problem. It was dated at 2.9 million years old. But the problem was, according to the evolutionists who dug it up, it was very modern. In other words, it was very human-like. In fact, according to evolutionary theory, it was way too human. Humans, or any human-like creature, at least one as human as that, should not yet have evolved. It was too old. Now, Leakey was not, uh, was not uh, misstating the evidence when he said, and I quote, either we toss out this skull or we toss out our theories of early man. Now you can imagine all the textbooks and scientific journals that would have to be rewritten if they toss out the, their theories of early man. So it was a very serious situation for the evolutionists. Now Skull 1470 was also Richard Leakey's cash cow. You got to remember, if you were the one who found the oldest human skull around, hey, the world is going to beat a path to your door. You're going to be, want, be wanted on television, in scientific journals. I mean, you're going to be the authority. And what's really funny to me, 
I get this from a lot of anti-creationists. They, they rail on us creationists and say we're in it for the money. Well, hold on a minute. Evolutionists are very much driven by money. Don't fool yourself. They, are, they have the needs as well. They need research grants to keep going. They need tenure for professors, etc., etc., etc. All this is driven around money. Now, I joke around a lot because I quit a nice, cushy job where I got upwards around $40,000 a year when I was teaching. And I loved the job. It was an awesome job. I gave up that job now to make, oh, somewhere between fifteen and $20,000 uh, a year. So, yeah, I'm in it for the money. That's what I tell people. Anyway, I ignore all those anti-creationists anyway. Okay, <laughs> if you're not dizzy yet, you're about to be. So, now the problem arises. Skull 1470 is found. It's uh, way too old for its modern look. So now the evolutionists start to get a little uncomfortable. What are we going to do about this? You only have a few options. And one of those options, of course, is redate the skull and redate the layers that the skull was found in. So the absolute dates that Fitch and Miller came up with, that everybody agreed with, that multiple dating methods agreed with, are now about to be sacrificed one by one. Okay, watch what happens. 1975, so this is a couple of years after the Skull 1470 was found. G.H. Curtis and Al and friends in Nature magazine used conventional potassium argon dates on pumice from three separate areas of the KBS Tulf. They claimed there was two distinct tough units. One at 1.6 million years old, and the other at 1.82 million years old. Notice those ages are more in line with what the evolutionists want? How interesting. What happened to the absolute methods? Or what happened to the absolute dates from the reliable dating methods? The multiple dating methods that all cross-referenced each other, that all confirmed each other. Oh, but it's about to get dizzier still. Now, this was younger than the previous five dating methods, younger, of course, than the age assigned to 1470. They concluded, get this, Fitch and Miller got the wrong dates because their samples were contaminated. The nerve! Can you imagine that? Fitch and Miller published their results in a peer-reviewed journal. Now, this is the part I like the best, because I get this from anti-creationists all the time. Oh, yeah, you creationists don't publish in peer-reviewed journals. So far, I'm not terribly impressed with what I see coming out of peer-reviewed journals. I think the peer-reviewed per process is a good idea, but as you can see here, peer-reviewed process means diddly squat. Because all this guy did was publish again in a peer-reviewed journal, disagreed with Fitch and Miller, and said, ah, that's, they got the wrong dates because their results were contaminated, their samples were contaminated. Question, um, how do we know Curtis's age is the correct one? How do we know that Fitch and Miller's is the wrong age? Hmm? So which one is right? They're both scientifically verifiable. Answer, simple, it's according to the evolutionary theory. Skull 1470 and consequently the KBS Tuff, they must be younger than what Fitch and Miller concluded. They have to be in order to line up with the evolutionary theory. Radiometric dates are based on the evolutionary theory. The two go hand in hand and if evolutionary theory disagrees with the radiometric date, you can quickly see which one's going to be sacrificed. There is nothing scientific about radiometric dating. I'm sorry. Now, Curtis et al. and Fitch and Miller both went to great lengths to make sure that the samples they were testing were uncontaminated rock. These are experts in their field. So which one's right and which one's wrong? Or are they both wrong? Hmm? So question. How do you know that the rock samples they did get were not contaminated? How do you know? And it's simple. As I already said, if the age doesn't agree with the evolutionary assumptions, the age must, the rock must be contaminated, and the absolute age is tossed out. Now, Fitch and Miller responded to the work of Curtis et al., and they noted scatter in the ages that Curtis and the uh, friends reported. They noted that there was a scatter in their ages. They got ages of 1.5 to 6.9 million years old in their samples. Question, how did Curtis and all know which date to choose? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's, it's a sideshow in a circus. And this is the best, uh, some of the best experts in the field of radiometric dating. 
Okay, this is ridiculous. So Fitch and Miller state, clearly the ages obtained by Curtis and L, I mean, obviously, are wrong because the samples they had lost some of their argon. So Curtis says that Fitch and Miller are wrong because their results were contaminated. Fitch and Miller say that Curtis is wrong because his samples lost argon. Hey, all sounds good to me. So who's right? It's dizzying. <laughs> in the end, as Lubinow puts it in his book, the pigs won. If you recall, I mentioned there was pig fossils found beneath the KBS top. Well, in the end, it was really the pigs who were made out to be the scapegoat and the reason, supposed reason, to reject the older radiometric dates and to go with the younger ones. Really, it surrounded Skull 1470. Now, I'm going to come back to Skull 1470, but I will close with this. In 1980, other studies found with fission track dating, <laughs> you remember I mentioned that before? Originally, the fission track dating lined up with Fitch and Miller's original dates. No problem. In 1980, another study was done, carried out in the same area, and potassium argon dating as well, and both confirmed the younger ages proposed by Curtis et al. So, in the end, it's just, it's dizzying. <laughs> it is absolutely dizzying. Seeing all the circularity and all the circular reasoning amongst all these very brilliant people. I mean, they're not st stupid people, and I'm sure they're not being deceptive. But they really are deluded into believing these ages are real. Now, to give you one more example, I missed this in the Complete Creation series. If you recall, I showed you this picture. Now, down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, uh, we have the Cardenas basalt layer, which was dated by multiple dating methods. And as you can see, there is also a lava flow, the Ewan Carrot Plateau lava flows, which flowed into the canyon. Obviously, the Ewan Carrot Plateau lava flows are going to be younger than the Cardenas basalt, which is down at the bottom of the canyon. Nevertheless, as you can see for yourself, most of the ages from the bottom one turned out to be older than the ages from the top. On top of that, please notice the wide range of ages for that lava flow into the canyon, the Ewan Carrot lava flows. They got ages of anywhere from 10,000 to uh, 2.6 billion years old. Now here's the catch. You can go and visit this website right here and check for yourself. They have photographs of Indian artifacts in the lava flows. The Indians, as part of their religious rituals, would attempt to capture some of this lava, some of this liquid lava, as it flowed into the canyon. We know those Indians lived there 800 to 1,000 years old, ago. Therefore, we know that the Ewan Carrot lava flows are 800 to 1,000 years old. The youngest absolute age provided by radiometric dating on that lava flow was 10,000 years old. The oldest was 2.6 billion years old. Tell me, how do we know which age is correct? You see, whenever we can test the radiometric dating method, it fails miserably. Radiometric dates are based on circularity and evolutionary assumptions. <laughs> ah, yes, my favorite part. You're a liar! <laughs> oh, dear. It always amazes me how fast these words come out of the mouths of the anti-creationists. I mean, this is the best you got? The, all you can do to answer my arguments is say I'm a liar? That's it? There's a lot of presumption in hurling around accusations of liar. Number one, they assume I know the truth and I'm specifically speaking something false, and knowingly that it's false. They assume that there is something that they know that I don't know. They also assume that, they, they do not assume that I perhaps know something that they don't know, which is a very distinct possibility. And they also assume that, assume that they know the truth. Uh, when you, that's why I produced this video series, so people can get to see the truth for themselves. Test what I say. Examine the evidence for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Now, uh, by the way, completecreation.org will be the official link for this video series. You can do uh, follow-up 
uh, with various references, resources, etc., devoted to this video series, and uh, including uh, Brock Lee's uh, resources that he made to accompany and be a companion to this video series for homeschoolers. So homeschoolers, visit creation, completecreation.org, and that will link you through to the resources page where you can download all those things as well. But at any rate, coming back to the false accusations that I'm a liar, uh, stop and think about this. It's, it's pretty obvious where this accusation is coming from, and it's coming from the father of lies. I mean, really, stop and look at it. Uh, it's very difficult to defend yourself against an accusation of lying. Because if someone just says you're lying, and you say, well, no, I'm not, well, you're just lying to protect your lie. So it's very difficult to defend yourself against. So I'm not even going to bother defending myself, because, frankly, false accusations speak more for themselves. I will, however, say this. I will say, bring it on. I get a lot of emails from a lot of Christians in particular feeling kind of sorry for me because I'm getting railed on on YouTube and being accused of all kinds of atrocities, which I never did. And, uh, but my response to them is simple. The words of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I say, bring it on. The more accusations that get hurled at me, false accusations, by the way, the more false accusations that get hurled at me publicly, eh, the more rewards I get in heaven. So I don't care. Bring it on. Uh, you'll notice, for instance, the ape, of course, makes more of a U-shape, whereas the human jaw makes more of a parabolic shape. But here you can see the general shapes of uh, the mouths of various man and ape. Now, I included Kermit the Frog's mouth shape in there because, of course, evolution has a frog turning into a prince. And if you don't believe me, well... Let's check out the most recent Scientific American issue, and in the article, This Old Body, where they try and blame your bad habit of hiccuping on your ancestral relationship to frogs. Yep, the truth is stranger than fiction. Okay, 